Well, we're at the end. We are ready for our last lesson in 2 Timothy. This very personal, very intimate, very special letter that Paul writes to his friend and protege, Timothy. If you were coming to the end of your life, how would you conclude the final words that you would ever write? Well, you're about to find out what Paul has to say. He's about at the end of his journey. If, if there's a word that I could use to describe the feeling or the sense of what you're about to see, it's the feeling of winter. Now, when I said the word winter, what immediately came to your mind? What are you talking about? Well, when you think of the word winter, I think of cold. I think of long nights, short days. Even in America, where we live in North Dakota, in winter, I go to church when it's dark. I come home when it's dark, and the days are so short. But honestly, how you think of winter kind of depends on what age you are or what your perspective are. For example, our children love winter. They're very excited when it starts to snow or when it gets cold. And almost all the time, they'll run out of the house. Their coats are barely on. They don't have anything on their head or on their hands. And they come back in and their hands are red and almost blue and very cold. But they're laughing and they're having a great, they love winter. I think that as I have gotten older, winter has become associated with work. It's like I have to shovel the snow to get in and out of our garage or our sidewalk so we don't slip and fall. And maybe it's, but that's my attitude. But winter, when we think about life, is a season. It's a time of life. Spring is on its way, but we have to endure the winter for the season before spring comes. But there's always the hope of spring. The longest winter always looks forward to spring. Last year in our state, we had a very long winter. It started early. It seemed to go on a very long time, but all of a sudden the sun shone, the snow started to melt, the grass started to grow, and there was hope again. Winter is not forever. It's just for a short time. But you know what? There's a winter of the soul as well. Everyone goes through difficult times, times of dread, times of isolation. I have been there myself at least twice. There have been times when in ministry I say, Lord, I'm so tired, I can't go on. Difficulties in our church or difficulties in relationship with people, it's like, Lord, I can't. And it's a winter of my soul. You get depressed, you get discouraged, you get defeated, and you say, I, I can't go on. And that darkness of the soul becomes oppressive, and it becomes difficult. Chuck Swindoll, who is a preacher in America, wrote a book a number of years ago called Come Before Winter. The title comes from the passage we're about to see. But he wrote a couple of short passages that really spoke to me that I'd like to share with you. This is what he writes. There is something strangely solitary about winter. Altogether, unlike the other three seasons, winter pleads for companionship. It's harsh blizzards that push even the strongest of fowl south drive us inside our own world. It is as though we are prisoners in our own dungeons of discouragement, loneliness, spiritual impotence as we struggle to keep our equilibrium to make sense out of such apparent insanity. It seems as though God has forever sealed shut the storm windows and drawn the drapes on hope and happiness. It was that last line that really caught me. It seems as though God has forever sealed shut the storm windows and drawn the curtains or drawn the drapes on hope and happiness. Have you ever felt that way? where it just feels dark, it feels lonely, it feels isolated. I want to tell you that for those of us who experience seasons of winter, of discouragement, there is hope. I return to one another short passage from Chuck Swindoll when he says this, Though days are bleak and time seems to stand deathly still, as the darkness thickens, he stays near. And as we reach out across the damp, inky cell, we find God's hand reaching back and becoming our only source of companionship. Thankfully, our panic subsides. How essential is His hand 
in hour. The picture is of a father reaching back with his hand and down to that of an outstretched child who says, please, hold on to me, help me, give me hope again. How many times have our children, when they're small, have done that very thing? Daddy, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. Daddy, please don't leave me. And they cling on with the last breath of hope that they have to say, Daddy, be my hero, be my strength. Can you help me? And I say, yes, I can. And as Swindoll writes these words, he stays near. Don't ever forget that. He stays near. The one who promised never to leave us, never to forsake us, never to let anyone snatch us out of their hands, he stays near. That's what Paul's looking for. He's about to finish writing his letter to Timothy. He knows that the end of his life is about to come. Everyone has left him except Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke is still a faithful friend. Some of, what, some of Paul's companions he has sent on to different places, but some have simply abandoned him, and he sits in his cell alone, wondering when the next time Dr. Luke will come to visit him or bring him a parchment or bring him a cloak or bring him a drink of water or something, something to help encourage his soul. But there he sits. He stays near. What you're about to see in Paul's concluding remarks are the names of 17 individuals. Individuals for whom he has instructions, individuals for whom he tells Timothy, this is where this person has gone, this is where this person has gone. There are names in this list that have broken Paul's heart. There are names in this list that have encouraged Paul's heart. But the bottom line are those three words, he stays near. The Lord has never never left. There are two bookends in this short passage as well. In another passage, we said bookends. There's one on the front, there's one on the back. I'm going to show you the one on the front, and then I think you'll see the one on the back end. The first bookend is in verse 9, when it says simply this, do your best to come to me soon. Do your best to come to me soon. Timothy, if there's any way you can get away from Ephesus for a little while, please come and see me soon. Now, thinking about the likelihood of this, it is a very small percentage that it's going to happen. Now, if this was the generation in which we live, we could send a text mail, and we would know that Timothy would have the message in the next few seconds. But we're in the first century. They don't have text messages. They don't have computers and emails. They don't even have the same kind of postal system that we do. The Roman Empire had a postal system where letters could be delivered, but really the only people allowed to use it were officials or military people. So if you wanted to get a message, such as this letter, 2 Timothy, into Timothy's hands, what you would do would be this. You would find someone who was traveling in that direction, and you would say, uh, brother, sister, are you traveling this way? Would you take this letter? My friend Timothy is in Ephesus, and I will tell you how to find him. And they'll say, well, brother Paul, uh, we're not going to Ephesus, but we are going to Macedonia, and I'd be willing to take your letter that far. Oh, he says, well, in Macedonia, I know this person, and maybe they can. It would take months for this letter to get into Timothy's hand. And then even if Timothy would write a letter in response right away, it would take months to get back. So we have to forget that we live in the 21st century as if to say, hey, Timothy, could you get on a plane and fly over here tomorrow morning? Not going to happen. Timothy, whenever you get these words, I may be gone, I may be with my Savior, but if you could please come. I want to see you one more time. Please, get here as fast as you can. Who would be that one person that you would be to be wished with you in your final moment? I want you to think about that. Is there someone that you know who has walked with you in your life's journey that at the last moment of your life you would say, I want that person there with me, please. For me, it would be my wife. For me, it would be my children. I have one or two very close friends, a man by the name of Roger in our church. He has looked after me. He has been a father to me. 
My father lives several hundred miles away. He has been like a father and a friend to me. I would want him there. Who, who would that be for you? In the winter of your life or the conclusion of your life, if you could call one person, who would that be? Paul says, I want Timothy. Timothy, would you come? We've shared so much. What he does in verses 10 and following then is to give a list of names. Now, some of them merit a couple of minutes of attention for us because they're significant. Like the one in verse 10, it says this. Do your best to come to me soon. Why? For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. That would hurt. Demas was a member of Paul's team. He had been a fellow close associate and partner. And the word for deserted means to utterly abandon and leave in a helpless situation. All of a sudden, Demas learned what opportunities were out there, and he said, I've got to go pursue those things. Bye, Paul. See ya. That was fun. When I first started coming to Russia, people would tell me that the only opportunities were in Moscow. That all young people, when they get done with university, they go to Moscow, and the problem is they never come back. And so it ends up harming the cities. Now, I don't know if that's still true today, but that's what was told me in those first few years. And the discouragement in the heart of somebody who lives in this city to realize all of our young people are abandoning us. They are deserting us. We need hope in our city again. That word for deserted, let me give you an illustration of what that means. Let's imagine that you and a friend are in a canoe and you're paddling across the lake. And it's maybe a mile or a kilometer and a half across the lake. And something happens in the middle. You guys are, are, are roughhousing or you're, you're goofing around and the canoe tips over. And it throws you upside down into the water. And you weren't thinking when you left, you didn't take any life jackets, any life preservers. And all of a sudden, the canoe is upside down and you've been thrown out and all of your stuff goes to the bottom of the lake. And here's you and your friend trying to swim, and neither of you is a very good swimmer. But that instinct to to preserve life kicks in, and you start paddling as good as you can towards the shore, and you're 200 yards, 200 meters away from the shore, and you're desperate, and you're trying to get air, and you're head above the water, and and finally, after a few minutes, you step up on the shore, and you go, I'm safe, I made it. And all of a sudden, you hear the sound of a voice, help help, I can't swim any longer. And it's your friend. You've known him ever since you were a little boy, and now you're both young men, you're strong men. But here he is, he's, he's trying to swim to shore, he's left the canoe behind, and he says, help, I can't swim anymore. Come, come back and rescue me. The idea behind this word deserted means, instead of turning to help him, You pretend that you don't hear, and you turn and walk into the forest as if you never heard him calling out for help. And your friend drowns. And you pretended that you didn't hear. That's how severe this word deserted me. Paul says, when Demas left me, I felt like he had left me to die. He utterly and completely abandoned me. He got enthralled with the things of this world. All of a sudden, he he looked at the things he didn't have. He got tired of traveling with me. We ate whenever we could. We never had any money. We never had food at the right time. And all of a sudden, Demas learned that he could get this job, and he could have some money, and he could have a home. And he says, Paul, I can't do this anymore. I'm leaving you. And it was like a stab of a knife in Paul's heart. And he's gone. I think, how many times does that happen in our world and in our culture today? When people, when when children grow up in the church and they learn the things of Jesus Christ and the things that the Word says, and then they get to university, and then they get done with university, and they get jobs, and all of a sudden it's like the the eyes of their mind grow, grow wild, and they see, if I could have this job, I could get that. I could have this car. I could have that nice house. I could have this beautiful wife or this this handsome husband, we could have children, and we could do vacations at the lake, we could have a lake home. And all of a sudden, all those enticements draw us away from the singular focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ. It happens time and time again. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TFS ministry. 
We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, visit www.tvseminary.com. A few lessons ago, I said, one of Satan's worst strategies is persecution. Because the harder that Satan stamps on Christians, the more they spread, and the more the numbers of Christians grow. But I suggested to you that Satan's most effective weapon is actually prosperity. That if we can see things that we don't have, that we want, that if we work hard enough or we bargain enough for that we can have, we'll say, I want that. And we forget about the heart issues of following Jesus Christ. That's what Demas did. Please be warned, young people. Wherever you're hearing my voice, be warned. Keep it simple. Keep a focus on the gospel. In that same verse, he mentions another man's name. He says, Crescens has gone to Galatia. Now, this isn't someone who has abandoned him. This is probably someone who was on Paul's team, and Paul had sent him to do ministry in this city. The next one is Titus. He says he's gone to Dalmatia. And he say, that name sounds familiar. If you know the scriptures and you know what happens on the page right after 2 Timothy, it says Titus. You say, is that the guy? He says, yep, that's the guy. This is one who had been on Paul's team too. This, this Titus had been on the island of Crete doing ministry there with the, the harsh people of that island. And he had been sent now to a different place, to Dalmatia. So that was okay. Verse 11, Luke alone is with me. Luke was a doctor. Luke is the author of the gospel that bears his name. He's also the author of the Acts of the Apostles. So he's a very skilled writer. He is a doctor. How appropriate that he would stay with Paul to maybe attend to his physical needs, his medical needs. But just the encouragement of being with him would have been an enormous encouragement to him. We know that he was a capable historian. We know that he was an evangelist. He would have tremendous impact on just staying with Paul there in the city of Rome. If you can think of one person in your life that would never abandon you no matter what, for Paul, that was Luke. Do you know someone like that? That if your whole world collapsed, this person would stay with you. That if financially you were ruined, if your relationships with people were ruined, if your reputation was ruined, would there be one person who stood with you? Who would that be? Are you thinking of a name? For Paul, it was Luke. He was the one who stayed. The next name is very intriguing because there's a story that goes along with it. It says this, Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful for me in ministry. I don't know if you know who this Mark is, but he was a relative of Barnabas. And Barnabas was the one who first mentored Paul after he became a Christian. He's the one who said, Paul, come with me. I'll introduce you to the disciples. We'll, we'll get you in conversation with them. He's the one who just kind of helped Paul in those first days of ministry to say, come with me, Paul. It's going to be great. Well, when Paul said to, to Barnabas, let's go on a missionary journey, and the church in Antioch said, let's gather some people to go on a, a journey to visit churches in the area and beyond, and they selected Paul and Barnabas to go. Barnabas had said, hey, I have this young relative of mine. He was either his cousin or his nephew by the name of Mark. Let's take him along. Paul says, all right, let's go. Well, it doesn't take long. And they're on their journey. And Mark gets homesick. I miss my mom. I miss her food. I miss my home. And he leaves. He deserts. We, we don't know how upset this made Paul until it came time for the first journey to end and the second one to begin. So Paul's second journey is about to begin, and Barnabas says, Hey, Paul, can we take Mark along? He's, he's grown up. He really has. He's not going to be a problem. He's not going to abandon us. Paul doesn't say, Yes, bring him along. He says, Not a chance. No way. Not going to take him. We're not going to make that mistake again. And Paul and Barnabas get in such a heated argument over Mark that the two of them end up splitting up. Paul takes Silas, Barnabas takes Mark, and they both go off on different directions. So what Paul thinks about Mark was so severe that he said, he will not travel with us again. But look at the change in Paul over the years. Something happened, something changed. 
We don't know exactly what it was. But over the years, Paul must have had an opportunity to know Mark and watch him grow up. Because the Mark that he talks about in this verse, he says, Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's very useful to me for ministry. Look at the change. No, he will never travel with us again to the day when he writes these words. Would you bring Mark with you? Just look at the tone of his voice. Bring Mark with you. He's very useful for me for ministry. I just go, wow, what a great story of redemption. This is, this is second chance. Sometimes we talk about God being a God of second chances, where he can forgive and he can heal and he can, he can help heal wounds and pains. Where he says, I know what you've done. I've seen your sins. I've seen the things that you have done wrong. And I choose to redeem you. I choose to make you mine. I can forgive you. Let's try this again. What a great example that this is. I just love that story. And the Gospel of Mark, we believe that he is the writer of that Gospel. What a tremendous gift that the Gospel of Mark has been. It's my favorite Gospel. There are second chances in this life. And Mark is a great testimony to that. Verse 12 talks about a man by the name of Tychicus. He was sent to Ephesus. In fact, we think that maybe he's the carrier of the letter, and maybe he's the one whom Paul is hoping will replace Timothy so that Timothy could come. Verse 13, and he's talking to Timothy. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all the parchments. Do you know why I like that verse? Even though Paul knows that the end of his life is very close, he says, I still want to read. I'd still appreciate having my cloak. Maybe I'll be here a while. If you have a chance to come by the city of Troas and you can meet Carpus, I left my stuff there with him. I, I was taken too quickly. Bring it with you. I love that spirit of never giving up, never assuming that the end is right next door, but that there may be more opportunities. Now, verse 14 presents another problem. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. We don't really know who this guy is. Alexander was as common a name then as it is now in Russia. But this guy, we know he worked with copper. But whatever he was, whatever role he played in the city of Ephesus, he says, Timothy, watch out. He, he damaged the gospel witness in that town. Timothy, be careful. Stay away from him. You see, the thing that intrigues me is, is the level of trust that Paul has in people. But he also has a trust that says, Timothy, when they have broken that trust severely enough and damaged that trust, he says, you need to be careful. Beware of someone who has damaged the ministry. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.